And good day, my listeners. We're at chapter 12, verse 10 of the book of Jeremiah. Thank you for joining me. It's always a pleasure. But unfortunately, I've got some sad news. Verse 10. Many pastors have destroyed my vineyard. They have trodden my portion underfoot. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. Notes. <clears throat> now, the pastors here are not as we normally think of such, but rather civil rulers, uh, such and even heathen rulers at that. Actually, this passage is speaking of Nebuchadnezzar and the leaders under him who would come into Judah and trod the portion underfoot. Uh, you know, this, this particular word, pastors, in this case, has nothing to do with a street preacher. But to read it that way, it still kind of makes sense, because many pastors, as we think of such nowadays, have caused quite a bit of problems. They don't teach the word correctly. They don't even attempt to. Verse 11. They have made it desolate, and being desolate, it mourns unto me. The whole land is made desolate, because no man lays it to heart. Notes. Well, God, who has been speaking in the future since, uh, since verse 7, speaks now as though it is in the past tense. Through foreknowledge, he knows that despite Jeremiah's continued prophecies, Judah was not going to repent, and consequently the awful finality comes through. 12. The spoilers are come upon all high places through the wilderness. For the sword of the Lord shall devour from the one end of the land even to the other end of the land. No flesh shall have peace. Notes. Now the spoilers are definitely the Babylonians with the sword of the Lord, at least in this case being Nebuchadnezzar. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar, although unwitting, will be as an instrument in God's hand to carry out God's will. Verse 13. They have sown wheat, but shall reap thorns. They have put themselves to pain, but shall not profit. And they shall be ashamed of your revenues because of the fierce anger of the Lord. Notes. Now, the sense of this verse is that Judah thought surely they were sowing wheat regarding their man-made religious worship. In their minds, they were actually very appeasing to God, especially by continuing to offer sacrifices along with the temple ritual as well as to other gods by their idol worship. They had also constructed for themselves a fallback position by looking to Egypt. It was all man devised and therefore it is God rejected. Consequently, instead of reaping wheat, they were going to reap some heavy thorns. You know, they thought they were doing all these good, wonderful things, and it made God's stomach turn. Verse 14. Thus saith the Lord against all my evil neighbors who touch the inheritance which I have caused my people Israel to inherit. Behold, I will pluck them out of their land and pluck out the house of Judah from among them. Notes. Now, the evil neighbors in this case are Egypt, Edom, Philistia, Ammon, Moab, and Syria. Due to these nations seeking to take advantage of Judah's problem, the Lord would bring judgment upon them as well. All this makes the unchangeable love of God and the unbreakable nature of His faithfulness clear to His ancient people. He has designed Israel as the center of all earthly governments. Uh, like it or lump it. And this national system is now in confusion because of Israel's fall, for she is the keystone. Her restoration will be their recovery. As a matter of fact, Israel is starting to recover right now. The Lord Christ as man and Messiah will unite in his person the headship of man and the dominion of Israel, which will take place in the coming kingdom age. The very fact that Israel was reborn on May 15th of 1948 and everything east of the Euphrates River has been in turmoil should tell you that this time is soon to be coming along. I mean, prophetically, it is just around the corner. It could happen probably within the next 100 years. Probably a whole lot shorter than that. Verse 15. 
And it shall come to pass, after that I have plucked them out, I will return and have compassion on them, and will bring them again, every man to his heritage, and every man to his land. Notes. Now as stated, this will take place in the coming kingdom age. And it's just around the corner. Verse 16. And it shall come to pass, if they will diligently learn the ways of my people to swear by my name, the Lord lives, as they taught my people to swear as they did unto Baal, then shall they be built in the midst of my people. Notes. The ways of my people means the divine way of salvation revealed and committed to Israel. Now, she did not do a very good job at, in the ancient past. She's not doing a very good job of that right now, but this will change. Now to swear by my name saying Jehovah lives is to worship God through Christ. For Jesus is God's greatest name. Verse 17. But if they will not obey, I will utterly pluck up and destroy that nation, saith the Lord. Notes. Now some of these nations that are mentioned earlier uh, in verse 14 will in fact uh, not obey and will be destroyed. Those nations, uh, those destroyed were Edom, Philistia, Ammon, and Moab. Three of these areas are now occupied by modern Jordan, with Philistia being occupied by Israel and the Palestinians. Egypt and Syria continue and in fact be greatly blessed by God during the coming kingdom age because of their acceptance of the Lord Christ. Isaiah chapter 19 verse 23 through 25. Uh, the area known as modern Syria in fact will be incorporated into Israel in the coming kingdom age. If memory serves me correct... Uh, Syria is actually a part of ancient Israel, but, you know, the land has been divided so many times, it's difficult to keep track of it now. Chapter 13. Thus saith the Lord unto me, Go and get you a linen girdle, and put it upon your loins, and put it not in water. Notes. Now, in a symbolic way, the Holy Spirit through Jeremiah will describe a divinely commanded action indicative of the approaching ruin of the people of Judah. This message was addressed to King Jehoiakim, who was about 18 years of age, to the queen mother Nehushta, and to the priest and people of Jerusalem. Now, the speaker is Emmanuel, not Jeremiah. He was just a mere instrument in this case. Verse 2. So I got a girdle according to the word of the Lord and put it on my loins. Notes. Now this is a linen girdle and therefore it was uh, meant to be beautiful and ornate. Verse 3. And the word of the Lord came unto me the second time, saying, Take the girdle that you have got, which is upon your loins, and arise, and go to Euphrates, and hide it there in a hole of the rock. Notes. Well, this, as with the linen girdle in many other um, instances uh, in the Bible, lets us know that God's leading is thus by design. Such teaches continued faith, leading, and trust. And uh, for verse 4, due to the phrase the second time in the third verse, Jeremiah probably wore the girdle for quite some time. The Holy Spirit evidently meant for the people of Jerusalem to see this girdle on Jeremiah in order that they may ultimately know what it actually meant. So Jeremiah makes this long trip of about 400 miles to the Euphrates, which he would have reached first at Carchemish, an ancient city. Verse 5. So I went and hid it by Euphrates as the Lord commanded me. Notes. Now even at this time, it seems that Jeremiah still had little knowledge as to what the Lord was going to do with such a symbol. However, he faithfully obeys. Verse 6. And it came to pass after many days that the Lord said unto me, Arise, go to Euphrates, and take the girdle from thence, which I commanded you to hide there. Notes. Now, the many days of this verse do not tell us the exact length of time, 
but it definitely could have referred to several years. However long it was, we were really not actually told, but it could have been quite a while. That's what the translation tells me anyways. Verse 7. Then I went to Euphrates and digged and took the girdle from the place where I had hid it, and behold, the girdle was marred. It was profitable for nothing. Notes. The original beautiful girdle was used as a touching symbol to teach Israel how Emmanuel had bound her upon his heart and worn her as an ornament, the fine linen expressing her purity. Well, definitely such was his love for her. But her disobedience compelled the Lord to remove the girdle and bury it at the Euphrates where it became marred and worthless, showing Judah's present spiritual condition. This symbolic action foretold the captivity of 70 years in the Euphrates Valley. Verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Thus saith the Lord, After this manner will I mar the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. Notes. Now the words, after this manner, refer to the girdle and its marred condition. As the girdle had been so beautiful and is now so marred, so will be Judah and Jerusalem. And the cause of all of this was pride and arrogance and idolatry. Verse 10. This evil people, which refuse to hear my words, which walk in the imaginations of their heart, and walk after other gods to serve them and to worship them, so they shall even be as this girdle, which is good for nothing. Notes. Now the great pride of the previous verse has produced this evil people. They just simply would not turn to God no matter what happened. Verse 11. For as the girdle cleaves to the loins of a man, so have I caused to cleave unto me the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah, saith the Lord, that they might be unto me for a people and for a name and for a praise and for a glory, but they would not hear. Notes. Both Israel and Judah lost all of their glory because of sin and because they simply would not hear the word of the Lord. And that continues on to some degree right now. Verse 12. Therefore you shall speak unto them this word. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Every bottle shall be filled with wine, and they shall say unto you, Do we not certainly know that every bottle shall be filled with wine? Notes. Now, the bottle in this case was a large wine skin made from a lamb skin or a cow hide or something to that effect. Upon instruction from the Holy Spirit, Jeremiah took several wine skins, hung them up in a straight line. They were then to be filled with wine. Verse 13. Then shall you say unto them, Thus shall the Lord behold. I will fill all the inhabitants of this land, even the kings who sit upon David's throne, and the priests and the prophets, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with drunkenness. Notes. Now the drunkenness spoken of here is symbolic in nature. The people were symbolized by the bottles and the wine symbolized the wrath of God against them. And boy, he was getting ready to thump their gourd big time. Verse 14. And I will dash them one against another, even the fathers and the sons together, saith the Lord. I will not pity, nor spare, nor have mercy, but destroy them. Notes. Now the words, I will dash them one against the other, refers to the Lord, allowing them to follow their own imaginations, resulting in utter confusion. Now you want to believe a bunch of false doctrine? God will allow you to be so watered down with it, you won't know, your, you won't know north from south. Verse 15. Hear me and give ear. Be not proud, for the Lord has spoken. Notes. Now, it's pretty obvious to me, but the Lord admonishes Judah to just simply sit down, shut up, and listen. She wouldn't. Verse 16. 
Give glory to the Lord your God before he causes darkness, and before your feet stumble upon the dark mountains, and while you look for light, he turn it into the shadow of death and make it gross darkness. Notes. Well, the light that Judah now has, which is the word of the Lord through the prophet Jeremiah, will soon be given away to darkness because the light is the Lord and not Judah's foolish imaginations. All of these other gods, they are nothing but darkness, death, confusion. They are little more than the imaginations of a person's mind. You carve up a chunk of wood and this is the God that created the heavens and the earth and we're going to pray to this thing and it's going to help us. Really. Verse 17. But if you will not hear it, my soul shall weep in secret places for your pride. And my eyes shall weep sore and run down with tears because the Lord's flock is carried away captive. Notes. Now as the Lord was speaking in previous verses, Jeremiah speaks in verses 15 through 17. The Lord is very clear in dealing with his people. Therefore, there are no excuses for misunderstanding. Here the cause is sin, and it is plainly outlined, and the cure, which is repentance, is plainly given. If they do not listen, it is because they don't want to hear. Verse 18. Say unto the king and to the queen, Humble yourselves, sit down, for your principality shall come down, even the crown of your glory. Notes. Now the fulfillment of this is found in 2 Kings chapter 24, verse 15. After a reign of three months, Jehoiakim, who was only 18 years old, and his mother, the reigning queen, uh, her name was Nehushta, they were taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar along with all of Jehoiakim's court. Alright, so nasty stuff. Verse 19. The cities of the south shall be shut up, and none shall open them. Judah shall be carried away captive, all of it. It shall wholly be carried away captive. Notes. This was fulfilled some twelve years later. The captivity being still a thing of the future, the prophet seeks to awaken the conscience of this king and his mother, but to no avail. If anything, they're going to persecute him. Verse 20. Lift up your eyes and behold them who come forth from the north. Where is the flock that was given you, your beautiful flock? Notes. Okay, now even though the Babylonians, uh, even though Babylon was due east, the invasion route was from the north. The flock that was given you refers to the people of Judah. And the implication is this. If the king and his mother would have led the people in a spiritual revival, this beautiful flock possibly would have followed. However, they had no desire for spiritual things, and their people had no desire for this son of David to wholly follow the Lord. Verse 21. What will you say when he shall punish you? For you have taught them to be captains and as chief over you. Shall not sorrows take you as a woman in travail? Notes. Now, the sense of this verse is that the military captains and civil rulers of Nebuchadnezzar will now be chief over you. They're going to be your boss. Judah would not have the Lord be captain in chief, and therefore a heathen monarch will, with very little pity, would serve in this capacity. I mean, I'm not casting asparagus entirely down on Nebuchadnezzar. He was an ancient king, and he's just doing what ancient kings did. They took over lands and tried to establish things. Verse 22. And if you say in your heart, Wherefore come these things upon you? For the greatness of your iniquity are your skirts discovered and your heels made bare. Notes. Now, iniquity, in effect the idolatry, caused all this judgment. Nakedness and bare feet are kind of an expression of slavery. Upon the coming catastrophe, Judah was going to say, Wherefore come these things upon me? And all the Holy Spirit tells them very plainly, It is the greatness of your iniquity. 
verse 23. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may you also do good who are accustomed to do evil. Notes. Now, this passage is using a figure of speech that tells us that um, it, it refutes any and all ideas that man can change himself. He cannot change himself for the better in the way that God needs man to be changed, yet people keep on trying. This is kind of referring to trying to save yourself. Verse 24. Therefore I will scatter them as the stubble that passes away by the wind of the wilderness. Notes. Now this is referring to the chaff that is separated from the wheat on the threshing floor. The wind of the wilderness refers to great trouble that was coming upon Judah, which in fact would be the scattering process. Verse 25. This is your lot, the portion of your measures from me, saith the Lord, because you have forgotten me and trusted in falsehood. Notes. Well, what type of falsehood is being spoken of in this passage? In this case, it pertained to the idols. However, in any case, it pertains to false doctrine uh, perpetrated by false apostles, deceitful workers, and Satan's ministers. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13 through 15. You got some ratchet jawed preacher or pastor out there that's going around teaching a bunch of nonsense that you can't find in the Word of God. Get away from him. As simple as that. Don't pay any attention to him. Go find you a church that's filled with God filled, uh, Holy Spirit inspired people, and your problems will quit happening. Verse 26. Therefore will I discover your skirts upon your face that your shame may appear. Notes. Well, the spirit of the text is that Judah has, sh has shamed the Lord and now he is going to shame them. Uh, God is saying, hey, uh, you're an embarrassment to me and I'm going to punish you for it. Verse 27. I have seen your adulteries and your neighings the lewdness of your whoredom, and your abomination on the hills of the fields. Woe unto you, O Jerusalem! Will you not be made clean? When shall it once be? Notes. In this passage, like many others, Judah is likened to God's wife. As such, she has committed spiritual adultery, and these whoredoms and abominations have not been slight, but rather as evil as they could possibly make them. I mean, just uh, uh, many verses ago, I was reading about how they actually practice lying, uh, making sure that they could get real good at it to deceive people. Chapter 14. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah concerning the dearth. Notes. Now, the word dearth, uh, it means drought in and it's plural in the Hebrew. In effect, droughts actually referring to the length of time the drought uh, lasted. And this was definitely an act of judgment sent by God himself. Verse 2. Judah mourns, and the gates thereof languish. They are black under the ground, and the cry of Jerusalem is gone up. Notes. Now, this drought should not have been unexpected because God had promised such if Israel went into sin. You can find this in Leviticus chapter 26, verse 19, and Deuteronomy 28, 24. Well, what God says he's going to do. Verse 3. And their nobles have sent their little ones to the waters, they came to the pits and found no water. They returned with their vessels empty. They were ashamed and confounded and covered their heads. Notes. Now, in this case, the nobles referred to the, uh, uh, it, it kind of referred to the upper classes of Judah and Jerusalem. The little ones in this case do not refer to children, but to their servants or even the common people. So it has uh, very little to do with children. No doubt there were servants among them, but it does not refer to children, but to their servants or even the common people, commoners. Verses 3 through 6 portray the futility of their efforts, though. 
There is no water, and they are ashamed and confounded to come back empty-handed, and therefore they cover their heads. They're confused. They don't know why things are going bad. Despite the repeated warnings. Verse 4. Because the ground is chapped, for there was no rain in the earth, the plowmen were ashamed, and they covered their heads. Notes. Now the word chapped, as you may well imagine, spoke of the ground being parched. It was dry and barren. This means that the physical drought was symbolic of a spiritual drought. Now the plowmen are symbolic of Jeremiah, who has no crops, in effect, no harvest. The people do not respond to his altar calls of repentance because their hardened hearts, which are symbolized by the seed put into the ground by the plowmen, which will not germinate because of a lack of spiritual water. Verse 5. Yes, the hen also calved in the field and forsook it because there was no grass. Notes. Now for you hunters out there, the word hen um, in the ancient language is a young deer. Some people may actually use that language to describe them now. It is noted for its devotion to its offspring, and yet the drought is so severe that it forsakes it. It does so because there's no food to eat, because there's no grass growing for it to eat. Kind of hard for a mama deer to raise uh, a baby. She's having to go out and look for herself. Verse 6. <clears throat> and the wild asses did stand in the high places and snuffed up the wind like dragons. Their eyes did fail because there was no grass. Notes. Now, the eyes did fail speaks of the animals and it refers to the lack of ability to find grass and the weakness that ultimately overtakes them. Verse 7. O Lord, though our iniquities testify against us, do thou it for your name's sake. For our backslidings are many. We have sinned against you. Notes. Now we have some intercessory prayer going on right here. Uh, the words iniquities and backslidings and sins express the moral character and the worthlessness of man, however high his religious privileges might actually be. And hence, forgiveness can only be prayed for his name's sake, in effect the name of Jesus. That name being perfection, it secures a perfect pardon. However, Judah of old would not trust in that blessed name of which the sacrifices were a typology. Verse 8. O oh, the hope of Israel, the Savior thereof in the time of trouble, why should you be as a stranger in the land and as a wayfaring man who turns aside to tarry for a night? Notes. Now you got to pay attention to the question. Why should you be a stranger in the land and as a wayfaring man who turns aside to tarry for a night? Well, this refers to an individual who is a foreigner in the land, someone who was only passing through, and consequently is not going to stay very long, probably just one or two nights. As such, because they were not citizens, they enjoyed no rights and had really no say-so whatsoever regarding the manner in which the nation conducted itself. They were just merely passing through. Well, that's the way God was treated. Judah treated him as if he was a foreigner, a stranger, and one who had really no say-so in the affairs of state. They were going to pay dearly for that. Verse 9, Why should you be as a man astonied, as a mighty man who cannot save? Yet you, O Lord, are in the midst of us, and we are called by your name. Leave us not. Notes. Now Jeremiah very soberly asked this question. Why should you be as a, a man astonied? Now the phrase means as one struck dumb. In these words which came from Jeremiah's heart and also inspired by God, one can easily see the broken heart of the Lord of glory. He struck dumb at Judah's reaction toward him. The continuing of the question as a mighty man who cannot save, this refers to one, in this case the Lord who has the might to save Judah, but in effect cannot save them because they will not follow him to allow him to actually save them in the first place. John chapter 5 verse 40. 
that being said, we'll pick up in chapter 14, verse 10 of the book of Jeremiah. Thank you and God bless. I'll see you later. Bye-bye.